is Wednesday, February the 16th, and hope you had a good night's rest last night. I had a semi-good night's rest. Um, I'm not sure how to quantify that, but I was <laughs> I did toss and turn a little bit last night. Uh, so, I'll be tired this morning. It'll be a long day today with tonight's activities uh, happening as well with the women's study and the men's study and choir rehearsal, all of those things tonight, Wednesday night. I enjoy Wednesday nights, and especially with the men that uh, I'm with on Wednesday nights. So I encourage you to make it a part of your priority to be in discipleship hour on Wednesday nights. Uh, we are called to go and make disciples and to make a disciple, we have to be a disciple. And that's that's what we center around on Wednesday nights. And so look forward to seeing you tonight. Um, today is, uh, we're, we're all heavy with uh, prayer concerns for Constantine and Leah. Uh, Constantine, of course, as I shared yesterday, hospice had come in. I was able to spend some time with Constantine yesterday and um, just some sweet time with him. But be praying for Leah. Uh, pray for uh, their children, uh, Vadim, Benny, and Christina. Um, and Crystal Gutierrez is really uh, coming alongside of her and ministering to her in particular during this hour. And so, just be praying for them, lift them up, and um, I know there are plenty of other prayer requests and needs in the body um, right now, and so many different <clears throat> individuals that are recovering from things, about to face things, and uh, just reminded that we need Him every hour. This morning when I woke up, I especially had this old hymn on my heart. Um, I've shared this before, but I like hearing myself tell it. My dad played steel guitar, and Every morning he started his morning by going into the workroom where his steel guitar was and he would sit and this would be the first song that he would play on his steel guitar is I need thee every hour and I think it's a good marker for us to remember every day we need him every hour and so let's make this a prayer as we sing it this morning. I need thee every hour most great like thine and peace of I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come
you down. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. time. Sing it out. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come I come to thee. Oh, Lord, we need you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, this morning we're picking up in John chapter 18. And um, if, you, if you've never really done this, I would encourage you to kind of just take some time in this passion story of Jesus and, and try to imagine... Uh, maybe put yourself in that place and try to imagine the scene and 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 the and the mood and all that was taking place in this of course we we know now we've we've come to chapter 18 after Jesus has has been arrested in the garden he's been betrayed by Judas Iscariot and they've now taken him and we pick up in in verse 12 um remember it was night and in Jerusalem there were the only light that would have been available or lit would have been small fires that would be burning or um, uh, lanterns that would be carried or or stick lanterns that would be placed on the wall and if you've ever been in one of those kind of places you know it's it's dimly lit they're like it's real shadowy you can smell the smoke in the in the city as as all of the fires are burning and and it's this kind of scene where Jesus is now rushed from the garden. A, a company of, of really what would be temple guards uh, had come to arrest him. And now they're taking him, and they, and they take him to the house of, of Annas. And Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year in Jerusalem. And I, I want to I paint a picture for you. Um, if you've been fortunate enough to go to Jerusalem the one thing that you'll realize is that, that all of these locations and places that are recorded here in Scripture are in very close proximity to one another, and they're in very close proximity to the temple. And you remember that, that Jerusalem was occupied by Rome at the time. Roman, Rome was the empire that ruled over all. But they allowed the Jews to have within their um, purview their own religion, their own practices, um, and as long as they stayed quiet, as long as they obeyed Caesar, and as long as they sent their taxes to Caesar, etc., they were allowed to dwell peaceably, although under occupation, but having their own little um, practices that they did. Now, the moment that there would have been any kind of uprising, Rome would have come in and quelched them almost immediately. And a representation of Rome in Jerusalem was the governor, um, Pontius Pilate. We, we're going to see him in just a minute. He didn't, he didn't uh, stay in Jerusalem, but he would come there and he would quarter in Jerusalem, if you will. And most likely, historians believe that he probably quartered in, in Herod's, one of Herod's old palaces. Now remember, all of this is in very close proximity to the temple. And so all of the religious and political structure of Jerusalem centered around that temple area. Anna's house would have been very close there. Um, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, would have been right next to the, to the temple grounds. And he only occupied that house while he was ruling as high priest. And Herod's quarters was very close. And so there was all of this politics intertwined with their practice of their faith as Jews, very much, there's a real parallel here, very much where we see, um, if you were to take Washington, D.C., and you see all the centers of political power, 
Well, there, there's an incorporation, unfortunately, within Washington, D.C., of, of evangelicals, Catholics, et cetera, within the, the mix of government. And anytime you have that taking place, it's not government that's going to be mostly influenced. It's probably going to be spirituality that's most influenced by government. And so that's kind of what you have here in Jerusalem. I was, I was kind of taken aback when I realized how close all these quarters were and to realize that many of the decisions that were made uh, by the priest were, were made in political, uh, weighed with political expediency. And so here's an example of that in these three verses. Verse 12, so the band of soldiers and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. So we have that picture in our mind. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Annas was also a, pri a priest as well. And so, but he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And it was Caiaphas, the high priest, who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, what John is doing is he's causing us to remember what he'd recorded in John chapter 11, shortly right after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, remember what he says here in verse 13. He says, Caiaphas is the one that had advised it's better that one man die for the nation than all of them. What he's making reference to is because there was such a following after Jesus and it was creating a turmoil in Jerusalem, if you will. And there was a fear that Rome would clamp down or that there would be an uprising. And so Caiaphas said, hey, it's better that we sacrifice one man, let one man die or, or let one man at minimum be arrested than for the, the Romans to come on the whole city and, and many die. And so here's what takes place in John chapter 11. If you have your Bible, I want to I wanna ask you to turn there with me. John chapter 11, this is immediately after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and picking up in verse 45. It says, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered to counsel, and they said this, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So you see that. They're afraid of what may happen. But one of them, Caiaphas, the same one that we're looking at in chapter 18, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for one, that one should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, many made plans to put him to death. Now, Caiaphas didn't realize that he was prophesying that Jesus would die for the nation of Israel. And not only would Jesus die for the nation of Israel, but Jesus would die for the whole world. That for whoever would believe in him, whoever would trust in him, would not perish but have eternal life. One of the things I wanna point out is this, is that oftentimes uh, we, we, can, we can see events taking place and, and never realize or recognize that God is sovereign and God is behind all of those events. In this case, Caiaphas thought he was making the decision, but behind it, God was, was fulfilling his plan and his will that Jesus would go to the cross and die. We have a term that we use for that, and that is sovereignty. And we've got to remember and trust that God is absolutely sovereign. We can look at events in our world. We can look at events in our country, in our nation. We can look at events in our own personal and sphere of life. And sometimes we get the idea that the sky is falling. But can I remind you that God is a sovereign God. God is in absolute control. There's nothing 
that has taken place or is taking place within our world, within our nation, within our homes, within our lives, that God is not absolutely sovereign. And God is working in those situations to fulfill his will in your life and in my life and his sovereign will as it is involved in all the whole totality of his will. So let me encourage you with these words today. No matter what you might be faced with, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you may have fears about. You know, right now in the news, we're, we're all concerned about Russia potentially invading um, Ukraine. And, and, and that is a concern and that may happen. Um, but we've got to remember, God is in sovereign control. We may have the idea that our nation is going to pot, and there are many places we look, and, and, and it's in bad shape. It, no doubt about it, it's in bad shape. But we as believers need to recognize that we are of another kingdom. We might be citizens of the United States in an official sense, but, but we are citizens of his kingdom. And the main purpose in everything is for his kingdom, for his glory, for his majesty, because he alone, he alone will rule and reign forever and ever and ever. The person occupying uh, Pennsylvania Avenue today, the person occupying it 100 years ago, will not live forever. But King Jesus will live forever. And so in the meantime, let's be about what he's called us to do, and that is to go and make disciples. Pray and ask God today. God, give me an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart today. God, if I recognize a seed has already been planted there, then Lord, you give me the wisdom and the know-how to know how to cultivate that seed. And God, by your grace, if you'd allow us to witness somebody be saved today, Lord, we pray that. So that, Lord, they may be a part of your eternal kingdom and they have the hope and glory of that. I pray the Lord blesses you today, that he keeps you. Look forward to seeing you this evening and um, love on somebody today. Have a great day.